those times where you're having tons of fun in a video game and then all of a sudden something ruins your fun? Well, here's a list of top 10 killjoys. Since other people have made their own list, I'd like to make my own. These are killjoys, aka with the words kill and joys in them. AKA, if they play in an already bad moment, they don't count. Only if you have fun with a game and that point ruins your fun. And this isn't based on boring segments alone. This is based on how much less fun you're having than you were a moment ago. And remember that this is my list, not yours, so please respect that. Here we go. I don't care what you say. If Quarter Guy and I don't like Shadow of the Colossus, and if we find it repetitive, we don't have to like the game. Bassaran is easily the second worst boss in the game for me. But wait, why is there a Killjoy on this list from Shadow of the Colossus if I didn't find much entertainment value with this game anyways? Simple. By the time I faced Bassaran, I had most interest in this game yet, at least not until right after the fight with him. I don't think it's the worst boss in the game, I mean Celosia is worse in my opinion, but I was already bored of the game way before I reached him. As for Bassaran, to get onto him, you should get him to tip over with the geysers and then shoot arrows at the undersides of his feet. This wouldn't bug me if it weren't for the terrible horseback controls! To just keep riding around and around trying to learn this beast into the geysers. Unlike in the rest of the game, this boss fight can last about a half an hour which is way too long for a boss fight. It didn't really bug me that much up until now because of the boss's formula. Alright, time to use one of my drive forms to level it up. What? Anti-form? Sometimes when you try to switch to Valier form, Wisdom form, or Master form, it turns you into Anti-form instead. Anti-form is a massive killjoy because you can't heal yourself and both your party members disappear no matter what form you attempted to switch to. I don't care if it's to balance out the game from being too easy. On beginner's mode, the majority of the fights were pushover anyways, and on proud mode, the game's bosses were hard even when I'm in the forms I need to level up in. And besides, I am capable of stalling out the battle before I return to normal, because anti-form gives you a lot of speed and airtime, so I can just keep jumping and running around to avoid the battle while the form runs out. But you can always choose not to use the forms, right? Perhaps you didn't hear my main problem with anti-form. If you want to unlock Hades' Paradox Cups, the requirements to unlock the Hades Cup are to level up all of your drive forms to level 7. And it takes a lot of patience. So for those of you who didn't know about this until the end of the game, this will be especially tedious. And the anti-form will keep stalling this. That is why I hate the anti-form so much. Thank goodness it doesn't kick in when switching to final form. Sonic Advance 3 is my favorite portable Sonic game. But, unfortunately, it has to be one of THOSE Sonic games where getting all the Chaos Emeralds is required to face the true final boss. And getting to the courses is a massive chore. In Sonic Rush, all you need is a high enough boost mirror to spin switches to get to the bonus stages. In Sonic 3, you just go through a giant ring to get to them. In Sonic Advance 3, however, you need to go through the stages and collect 10 Chao that are scattered throughout the entire level, which is made bad because the levels are very overexpansive. And after you get all 10 of them, that's not enough! You now go back into the levels and find a key with the same overexpansive levels that doesn't stay in the same spot every time. And then you can unlock the bonus courses. And the bonus courses are completely boring. You fly on a plane trying to get enough rings, but the strafing controls lag way too much. If you don't get enough rings, which you likely won't, you lose your key and must get another one. Why does such a terrible mini game exist in my favorite portable Sonic game? The kelp forest is utterly atrocious. I mean, let's look at what we got to do before this point. We got to glide across the rooftops, fight crime, and race down some giant sand slopes. What's done here? Wandering around aimlessly through a nearly pitch black level. In the beginning it's not too bad, but when you get to the kelp lake, there's way too much leaf jumping to do on it, where the leaves completely blend in with the water and you won't see where you're going to land until you drown. 
the kelp caves are darker, and there's a lot of ledges that you won't see before you fall down them and are forced to climb all the way back up. The kelp finds aren't in as much darkness, but they're painfully skinny and easy to fall off. Good thing this game was able to redeem itself with the Spongebob's dream level. Angry Aztec is one of my favorite levels in Donkey Kong 64. The music, scenery, and puzzles are all really cool. I'll have Tiny jump into the sparrow and play the saxophone to summon Squawks to get into this temple. What's in here? Oh no! I'll admit, I can tolerate the one in Crystal Cave because of the gorgeous scenery and the fact that you switch between using the orang sprint and sliding. In this one, however, that stuff isn't here. And don't get me started on the stupid music! Slow portions of platforming games are normally tons of fun, but this one isn't. To win, beat the beetle in a race and get 50 coins. This might not have been so bad if this overgrown pest didn't maliciously try to ram you to make you lose coins. And if you fall off, let him beat you, or don't get enough coins, he deliberately mocks you for it. Now if you excuse me, I'm off to run to the store and buy a few gallons of insecticide spray. Wait, I can't go anywhere until I finish this list? Fine. I'll get on with the top five. The ones that give me a major headache just thinking about them. Alright! Chapter 4 is complete! I beat the boss of Creepy Steeple and it's on to chapter 5. Let's get out of this place. What the? Am I playing as the boss now? Or did the boss just steal my body? And here we have a good candidate for most infamous moment in the game. We must walk all the way down to Twilight Trail to get back to Twilight Town. And I can't use Yoshi to get there faster since this overgrown seed stole my friends. We get a cutscene where Vivian gets tortured because intelligence system thinks it's funny. I get that Marilyn and Beldum learned their lesson at the end of the game, but this scene is played out for comedy, except it's not funny. If you want a scene to be funny, at least try, and if you want to show character development, you have to have them slowly start to understand Vivian's pain before... Oh, sorry, got off track. You come across the ghost who stole your body. He asks you to guess his name. He gets random names and he says, Who would name their kid that? Yeah, that's not horribly offensive to people with that name at all. Is this supposed to be this game's way of laughing at our misery? There's nothing funny about it. You're back in Twilight Town and... I'll admit, you get an awesome party member. Too bad you have to go back on that trail, back to Creepy Steeple. Oh, and he'll keep interrupting your game every time you cross a certain point. Thing is, I knew his name was Dupless before I played Thousand Year Door, and yet when I guessed that his name was Dupless, he still tells you no! Blast you stupid Dupla Ghost! I hope you burn and rot in the depths of- Hey! Mr. Devious Dupla Ghost, what are you doing here? He's my mascot, you know. But I can explain! Don't disrespect, slick. Glad that's all over. So, like I was saying, apparently, you can't guess his name unless you go all the way back to Creepy Steeple and get the lowercase p, because typing it all in uppercase doesn't work. If you remove both the uppercase p and the lowercase p, this mission would still be tedious, but at least his comment about me guessing his name was Dupless wouldn't be as infuriating or insulting. So you must go through that long, tedious road back to Twilight Town to see him. Once you guess his name, guess what? He flees the creepy steeple, and you know what that means? MORE BACKTRACKING! The boss fight itself isn't half bad, but why did the developers think this would be a good idea? It's not the worst part of the Paper Mario game though, at least it's not as bad as that hard labor section of Super Paper Mario forced on you by that stupid brat Mimi who needs to be shredded into a million pieces by a chainsaw! But I wasn't having as much fun before that point as I was before this point. Intelligence systems? As much as I love Thousand Year Door, you'd better make a remake of it and fix the backtracking issue! And to think, Dupless has the audacity to call us the Killjoys. <laughs> I've said this before and I'll say it again. I didn't mind Yoshi's New Island as much as everyone else did, but I'll admit there are good reasons people hate it. The worst parts of the game for me would either be the intro, which doesn't even count because even though it's atrocious, it doesn't count as a killjoy since it's before the game even starts. The other thing being the final boss. The build up to the final boss is quite interesting since it gives you the feeling of slowly approaching the final boss and even has different music, 
But then when you go to the room right before the boss, they completely recycle the pre-boss room to the final boss in the original game, and they were so lazy that they reused the same build-up cutscene to the original final boss. Then, if you haven't already guessed, this boss is an insult to the original final boss. The first phase is even more pathetic than the first phases of the original, except you throw eggs at him as opposed to the creativity of pounding the ground. And the second phase is probably the biggest disgrace to a boss I've ever seen. Instead of looking intimidating like the original game, he looks like an overgrown twit. The shading on him is really bad, and it's easy to stay alive because the easiest way you'll die is if you fall into the lava, which won't happen unless your hand slips or something because of how the platforms barely shift at all. Baby Bowser in this game is a huge insult to an awesome boss. I still love the original final boss, but I would have loved it more if this boss didn't insult it. Believe it or not, there's another boss right after Baby Bowser where you'll fight future Bowser. That fight is also terrible, but more terrible than the fight with the Baby Bowser fight because there's some intensity to that, but that doesn't erase how awful this fight is. Smash Bros. 4 is definitely an awesome game, but it has its ups and downs. The gamer stage is my most hated stage in the entire game, and unless we get any worse stages in the future installments, it's my most hated stage in the entire franchise! What makes me hate the stage so much is that MOM! There are two problems with that. First off, the fact that your mom is the stage hazard? I don't care if it's based off a game and Wario minigame. Making your mother a stage hazard in a fighting game? That's stupid! That's not my only problem with this, though. Not only is it idiotic for a mother to be a hazard, but as a stage hazard, she's annoying as heck! And sometimes she appears when you're not ready for it. I mean, how are we supposed to know that she can pop out of the TV? And sometimes there's not enough reaction time. I know what you're thinking. Well, other stages like Distant Planet and Summit had worse hazards. Well, on Distant Planet, the stage darkens giving you a warning sign that you should move away from the slope. And in the Summit, you only get eaten on the bottom platform. With this, on the other hand, it can not only happen out of nowhere, but even when you're safe, there's almost no room to fight sometimes. This is even worse than the past your bedtime event match. We have to get Ness, Bowser Jr., and Toon Link all to fall asleep at the same time, but it's really hard to one that mom keeps interfering. I don't care if you people like it. Just because you think it's funny doesn't mean I automatically have to agree with your opinion. Remember, this is my list, my opinion, so learn to respect that. When I heard that your mom is a stage hazard here, I already expected that this would be a bad stage, and it's actually worse than I expected it to be. The only time I will ever play on the stage is if it's an Omega form. And, let's face it, every stage has an Omega form. We should have gotten a stage from the Wario World rather than this. I know that Game & Wario was more recent, but I'd rather have a Wario World stage than this. <laughs> Chrono Trigger is among one of the best games ever created. It's definitely my favorite game on the Super Nintendo, thanks to the amazing story, the beautiful soundtrack, and the absolutely solid gameplay. There are a couple flaws in the game, but nothing that necessarily infuriates me. Wait. What the? Hey, idiot! You can let go, you realize that? Luca's right beneath you, she can catch you! Why isn't anyone else trying to help you? Hopefully, Chrono can do something about that. Are they? Oh no. Well, they should land on the ground soon enough. Um, they're not going to land, are they? Okay, fair enough. That's fine. Let me see if I can put this properly. WHY DID YOU MAKE THIS IDIOTIC EXCUSE OF AN ENDING?! It's so bad that it doesn't even deserve to have music from Chrono Trigger playing in the background, so I'm using a different song. I'm glad there are multiple different possible endings, but this is hands down the worst ending. Chrono and Merle just got stuck to balloons, and they are never seen landing, so we can assume that they'll never get back to Earth, and we're supposed to find that funny. I'm no expert on helium, but I'm pretty sure it would take way more balloons than that to carry those two away. The helium doesn't leak out of the balloons, they carry them into space. There's nothing funny about watching Chrono and Merle get carried into space, you know, where there's no oxygen, and where they'll suffocate to death? Did they even think about that? These two saved the entire world, and this is the thanks that they deserve? This is hands down the most mean-spirited ending cutscene to any video game ever. There's nothing funny about watching two good guys get taken from the planet forever and suffocating to death. You can't just be like, hey, Chrono and Marvel fans, 
two of your favorite characters are about to suffocate to death. Laugh now or else. Even if they didn't think about how they can't breathe in space, why was this ending even considered? Wait, why does this count as a killjoy? I didn't say that they had to be gameplay only. It has the words kill and joy in it, and it kills my joy, so there! This should be an emotionally satisfying ending, but it's even worse than the old projector ending. I'd rather have a low quality and anticlimactic ending than a horribly mean spirit and an unbelievably stupid ending! This ending does the same thing to Chrono Trigger that Agatha did to Twilight Princess. Chrono Trigger is still an epic game, but this moment right here is so atrocious that it makes me forget about all the amazing times I had with Chrono Trigger! The only reason it's not number one is because there are multiple endings and this is only one of those. Take the normal ending and it's much better. Like there's another ending where Morrow gets stuck to balloons and even that one's better because Morrow was seen landing safely in that one. This one on the other hand, they're never seen landing. If we saw them land safely, this ending would have actually been quite cute. But no, this ending is horrible! So we've seen a very poorly designed control stick wiggler, a disease to level grinders, a minigame with horrible controls, an incredibly dark forest, a sliding game with potential that it just threw out the window, an instance of having to go back and forth repeatedly, the worst final boss ever, the dumbest idea for a stage ever, and a horribly mean spirited ending that we're supposed to laugh at. But with most of these entries I could kind of see what they were trying to do with them. With number one on the other hand, there is no excuse, I repeat. NO EXCUSE FOR IT! That is a part of Final Fantasy VI where you keep getting fish. You'd expect something big after surviving the apocalypse! So what do we do after that? We play as Celise and keep going to the shore to get fish and bringing them back to her grandfather. Do you see what is wrong with this? We're forced to constantly go back and forth between the beach and the house in order to do this. There is literally nothing else to it except for how you should go for the faster ones and ignore the slower ones for they'll make his illness worse. I wouldn't mind that, but this goes on for about half an hour of nothing but going back and forth between the beach and the house! Wouldn't eating that much fish at a time cause him to get even sicker? And sometimes there aren't enough fish in the sea, so you have to constantly walk back and forth between screens in order to reset it. And every time you walk back into the house, you have to wait for him to get into bed before you can feed him the fish. I didn't feel like someone's life was in my hands when doing this. If anything, it completely ruined the mood. I literally kept asking myself, WHEN IS THIS GOING TO END?! What's the point of this? It won't change up the gameplay in any way whether you keep him alive or kill him off! Something does happen if he dies though. Celise's grandfather dies in an actually heart-wrenching scene. And Celise feels like she has literally nothing left, not even her friends, or a way to reach out to the rest of the world. So she decides to throw herself off a cliff. It's just so depressing to watch. They showed something this sad in an NES game. Luckily she survives and finds out that her friends are still alive out there, so she uses the raft to get back to the remains of the world and search for her missing friends. This is a primary example of how to portray suicide correctly in media, and that actually makes me hate this fishing mission even more! It is the deciding factor of whether you get to witness the emotional scene within the context of the game or not! I, not knowing that this was the deciding factor, wanted to save him because I didn't want to feel like a soulless backstabber. If they had just skipped the fishing part and had Celise's grandfather die no matter what happens, this would be more understandable. But no! Instead, we get the most repetitive instance in any video game I've ever played, making it my number one biggest killjoy! 